it's time for another edition of the Collector's Corner. And welcome to another edition of the Collector's Corner. Brought to you by our friends at the Sadistic Penguin Studios. I am your host, Aloha Mr. Hand, the man of questionable character. And today, September 22nd, 2024, the White Sox have achieved the dubious distinction of tying the 1962 Mets with 120 losses. And they still have a week to go. And I'm the one with questionable character. But whatever. So it got me to thinking, as the White Sox have achieved this have achieved this stunning goal, who are players that played for both the White Sox and the Mets? And there are a few. Mike Cameron's an example of one. But I wanted... Robin Ventura is another one. But I wanted to focus on one in particular. One who I would say is the greatest Met of all time. And a pretty damn good player for the White Sox too. Hall of Famer. He's known sim- He was known simply as the franchise. That's right. Tom Seaver. Tom Seaver started his career with the New York Mets. He was a member of the 1969 Miracle Mets that beat the Baltimore Orioles in five games in the World Series. He also won the Cy Young that year with 25 wins that year. The Mets won 100 games, outpacing the Cubs in a Cubs late August-September swoon where the Mets just drove right past them. And if you want to have fun, go look up the Cubs-Mets series in Shea Stadium in September of 1969. That is when the black cat crossed Ron Santos path and that is forever known in club Cubs lore. But anyway, so Tom Seaver, hall of famer, 300 game winner. No question. He is the greatest player that played for both teams. Um, Not the greatest player for the white Sox. That of course is Frank Thomas. But if you take the players who played for both teams, it's Tom Seaver. Then it's everybody else. I love Robin Ventura. Not on the same level. Sorry, they're just not. And so I decided, let me get out some of my Tom Seaver stuff that I have to show off today in honor of this dubious distinction that the White Sox have tied and undoubtedly will pass Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. I'm thinking Tuesday night, but I'm going to be at all three games because I want to be there. I want to be there when they do break the record so that I can let them know how I truly feel about it and what a stunning achievement it is for this team that whose owner has wants to win more than anybody else. Well, guess what? You got to wear the fact that your team lost more than anyone else. And sadly, on a side note, I wish that Kenny Williams and Rick Hahn were still here so that they would have to fucking wear it too. Sorry for the language, but they deserve it. But so anyway, I digress. So let's start with, okay, I already showed you the cover. I'll show it again just in case. The franchise. That's what he was. He is the guy who almost single-handedly lifted the Mets up from being a loser to being a winner. And the first item I'm going to show off is a Tom Seaver autographed baseball Beckett certification. Right there you can see Tom Seaver. Distinctive autograph uh, for him. Uh, And again, I try to get everything autographed that I have, uh, either PSA, Beckett, JSA. Uh, That way I know I have more of an idea of authenticity and also for insurance purposes. But also, so moving on, the next item I have is a Perez Steel Tom Seaver Hall of Fame postcard signed. You can see, uh, you know, authentic autograph. There's a new documentary coming out about Dick Perez, the artist behind these. Fascinating. I got a chance to see it a couple weeks ago when I was in Cooperstown. It's well worth the watch. Uh, it, it covers the man's life, uh, not just the work he did, but it also goes into how they reached this deal with the Hall of Fame to produce these and some of the artwork. The artwork is fantastic. If you're a collector, I'm sure you've seen it before. It's fantastic. It's awesome. And he, he is, of course, known for the Dunruss Diamond Kings cards 
that were in the Donruss sets in the 80s into the 90s. That's one of his biggest achievements. And some of those cards are just beautiful. But anyway, moving on. So next, as I said, Tom Seaver won three, over 300 games. His 300th win coming with the White Sox. I'll get to that in a second. But this is a Hall of Fame induction uh, letter. Or I shouldn't say letter. I should say envelope. You can see 1992 Hall of Fame induction Tom Seaver. At the time he was inducted, he was the, he had the highest percentage of votes for an inductee. I think it was like 98.6. He has since been eclipsed by Ken Griffey Jr., who eclipsed him when Griffey went in in 16. And then, of course, Mariano Rivera, when he went in in 2019, when he got 100% of the vote. Can only tie that, can't beat it. But And also remember, that percentage is based on the number of people who submit votes. So one year you could have 400 people submitting votes, next year you could have 395. It's all based on how many people submit votes and how many people named the particular person on their ballot. So moving on, as I said, Tom Seaver started with the Mets. He pitched for them from roughly 1967, where I believe he was Rookie of the Year in 67. Won the Cy Young in 69. Won a second Cy Young in 73. And won a third Cy Young in 1975. As you can see, the guy was damn good. If you ever watched him pitch, he had a method called... His pitching method was called uh, drop and drive. So basically, you would see his knee, his right knee, scrape the ground, basically, as he was delivering the pitch. That way, he was putting all the force of his pitch from his lower body. That's where it all came from. That's why he had no real wear and tear on his arm. Let me rephrase that. He had wear and tear on his arm, but not uh, surgery type of wear and tear or anything like that. So it was a almost perfect pitching method. If you go back and look at him, you'll see. He also had 19 strikeouts in a game against San Diego in 1970, I want to say. Uh, I believe it was 1970. You know, Padres had it rough for a while because... They had that go against them, and then they had the Doc Ellis LSD no-hitter in 1971. If you ever want to watch something interesting, watch the Doc Ellis documentary because he goes into that, and it is wild, to say the least. But moving on. So in 1977, the Mets traded Tom Seaver to the Cincinnati Reds. Now, the Reds at the time were the two-time defending World Series champions, the Big Red Machine, uh, they were overtaken by the Dodgers in 77 and 78 for the NL West division title. And then in 79, the Reds did... Oh, my hat's a little crooked. i got to fix that. In 79, the Reds did win the division again. They went up against the We Are Family Pirates and lost to them. Uh, so he did pitch in the 79 playoffs, I believe. And he pitched for the Mets through 1982. Side note on the Reds in 1981... The Reds had the best record in baseball, but due to the way they handled records from because of the strike, the 52-day strike, I think it was 52 days in 1981, the way they handled the records in the strike, the Reds did not make the playoffs because they awarded a first-half division champ and a second-half division champ. The Reds were in second both times, but cumulatively, their record was the best record in baseball and they didn't make the playoffs. And similar situation happened with the Cardinals in 1981. The Cardinals went on in 82 to win the World Series, just on another side note. But anyway, so here is a, another envelope saying, Tom Seaver made baseball history by starting his 15th opening day game, passing Walter Johnson's record. And he did this for the Chicago White Sox. You can see there, there it is, with the April 9th, 1985 stamp on there. He did not get the start in 1984, the opening day start, because Lamar Hoyt was coming off a of Cy Young, and the White Sox opened up in Baltimore that year. After losing to them in the 83 ALCS, they were there to see the Orioles get their champion rings, but Lamar Hoyt started that game. Fisk got hurt, and the year went downhill right away from there. But here is the envelope. Again, JSA certified. One of the things... I. I like JSA, I like Beckett, 
but I do prefer PSA just because of the because you can get the the encasing in it to make protect it a little more. Personal preference. Some others like other things. As someone's calling me right now, so there is that. Moving on, I have another Tom Seaver autograph. I wanted the 85 big cards, JSA again. So you can see signed right there wearing the Sox uniform. And then, as I said, you know, he went in the Hall of Fame and he was a member of the White Sox. This is a envelope from Celebrating Comiskey Park, which was closed on September 30th, 1990. It's hard to believe it's been 34 years already since the park closed. I was there that day. I admit I did cry. It was like losing a family member. Spent many a youthful day at that place. I love that place, but I'm going to be completely honest. It was time to go. So we'll show that off. Also, Tom Seaver appeared in three World Series. Three. Key here. Because... The Mets won in 1969. The Mets lost in seven games to the Oakland A's, who repeated as World Series champions since they had, champions since they had won in 72. 73 was the second, and they did win again in 74. Now, he did pitch in Game 6 and lost to the A's. He also pitched in Game 3 in Shea Stadium. But had to show this off. This is a ticket stub from Game 7 of the World Series. Let me turn it the right way. As you can see, Game 7 is when Reggie Jackson hit his first World Series home run. First. Mr. October's first World Series home run was in this game. As you can see, it says, you know, Reggie Jackson. Uh, he was also the 1973 World Series MVP and the 1973 AL MVP. So you can see it also has Mr. October on there. I tried to get him to sign it with first World Series home run, but that was not one he was willing to do. So, again, and one more thing I'm going to show for a couple things I'm going to show real quick. This is a ticket stub from his 300th win in New York on Sunday, August 4th, 1985, I believe is the date. Let me see if it's on here. It should be, but it's not. Oh, yeah, Sunday, August 4th. It is. It is right there. Sunday, August 4th, 1985. I'm going to point out to you, this is Yankee Stadium. Look at that field level box ticket price. That's not a misprint. You're not misreading that. That says $725. Yes, $725. Even back then, the Yankees were outrageous with their ticket prices. And that is, a, that is also a Billy Martin year with the Yankees. Side note on that year for the Yankees, 1985. That's the year Don Mattingly won the MVP. There's a lot of people who argue he should have also won in 86, but that's when Roger Clemens won the MVP. And there's a lot of debate on whether or not a pitcher should win an MVP. There's been other cases where pitchers have won MVP. Koufax has won. Gibson and... Koufax did it in 63. Gibson and Denny McClain both won MVP and Cy in 68. Look at their numbers for that year. Both of them. It's insane. McLean had 31 victories, the last 30-game winner in baseball, and Bob Gibson had an ERA, 1.12. Think about that, 1.12. That season led them to lowering the mound so that offenses had a better chance. You could, you could say what you want about it after that. But also, now, I said that Tom Seaver was on three pennant winning teams. Three. The 69 Mets, the 73 Mets, and the ultimate irony. Tom Seaver was a member of the 1986 Boston Red Sox. He Remember, the White Sox traded him to the Boston Red Sox with part of the package coming back being Steve Lyons. Yes, the pant dropping Steve Lyons a couple years later. But, so that means Tom Seaver was in the Red Sox dugout for Game 6 of the 1986 World Series. 
And I'm going to do a little Vince Scully. Behind the bag. It gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight and the Mets win it. Remember, the Red Sox were down to their last. Or I, duh. The Yankees were. The Yankees, please. The Mets were down to their last out. Losing in game six. And they came back and won. It's. If, you ever, if you've never seen it. How can you call yourself a baseball fan if you haven't seen it? But go watch that inning. It's extra innings, too. It's the 10th inning. Dave Henderson, then with the Red Sox, who later went on to Oakland, hits a home run to give the Red Sox the lead. The Red Sox get the first two outs in the bottom of the 10th, and then all hell breaks loose. Little known fact about that, Game 6 was on a Saturday night. Game 7 was not played till Monday, because they were rained out on Sunday night. Monday night, you had the Mets playing at Shea, and you also had the New York Giants on Monday night football. And they were saying during the Monday night football broadcast, you could hear the cheers in New Jersey for coming from Shea Stadium. I do not know if that's true or not, but I find it fascinating. Not knowing the proximity of the two stadiums, Kind of hard to tell for me, but whatever. One more thing I wanted to show off, and this is, you know, like I said, the White Sox have very have a few infamous moments in baseball history. The first being, of course, the 1919 Black Sox scandal. The next being July 12th, 1979. You may ask me what's significant about that day. A at the time, a little-known disc jockey in Chicago named Steve Dahl decided to have a promo at Comiskey Park where they, if you brought a disco record, you got a ticket to get in for 98 cents because he was on the loop. FM 98 at the time. Later on, it became FM 97.9. This thing's got more digital. But it was known as FM 98 at the time. So 98 cents got you a ticket to the game. A ticket like this one. That's right. This is a ticket from Disco Demolition Night. As you can see, let me turn it the right way. It, it's the rain check from July 12, 1979. PSA certified that this is a ticket from Disco Demolition Night. I had to show that off just because that's just another infamous moment in White Sox history. Today goes down as another infamous moment in White Sox history. And Tuesday may go down as another infamous moment in White Sox history. If it's not Tuesday, it'll be Wednesday or it'll be Thursday. But guaranteed, it's coming this week. The White Sox will set the record for most losses in a season. Remember, they were supposed to be in their contention window. Remember, Rick Hahn told us about having parades. Are we having a parade for this one? I wonder. And I really hope for the sake of the White Sox marketing people, because they've already started this, that they don't finish with 125 losses. Because if you look at some of the advertising they're doing for season tickets next year, what are they advertising? 125-year history of the White Sox. 125 losses in 125 years? Do not make a good combo for trying to advertise your product. I pray for them because there are some very good people in those offices that are probably getting abuse. They don't deserve because of the decisions of three fucking idiots. Sorry for the language again. That's all I got. If you got anything else, feel free to, if you want to see something, you can feel free to ask me. I'll see if I got it. Can't guarantee it, but good luck, everyone. It's tough being a White Sox fan right now. Hopefully, this disaster is the public humiliation this franchise needs to realize they need to change their ways and modernize themselves. Thanks a lot, guys. And with that, I am out of here. Bang. <laughs>